John Adams' Letters from the Front podcast for November 1918. This podcast looks at World War I through the letters of John Adams, who was 23 when he joined up in September 1914. He served with the 9th Service Battalion Royal Irish Fusiliers and was involved in many significant events on the Western Front, particularly Passchendaele. These are his words, read by his grandchildren and narrated by his great-grandchildren. This month sees the end of the war. The armistice was signed and while John Adams is first of all in the Dublin hospital where he hears the news and then later on in Belfast, he is at the end of the war. He made it. In the letters this month we hear about John moving from Dublin hospital to a Belfast hospital and the hope that he will be home for Christmas. And in fact, I believe he was because there are no letters in December. We also hear about troubles in Dublin. And this is probably a foreshadowing shadowing for the next few years of the, for the history of the island of Ireland. In our history section, we look at how the war came to an end. That didn't just happen overnight, but it happened over many months. And for this podcast, we'll be coming to an end in the next two episodes. We're going to take December off and then be back in January and February with the last two episodes. Rounding off about people coming home after the war and also, well, what happened to John Adams after the First World War. My name is Mark Adams and John Adams was my grandfather. The war ended at 11am on November the 11th, 1918. For John Adams, his war had ended over a month before, and by the time the war ended for everyone else, he was still in hospital in Dublin. The 9th Service Battalion of the Royal Irish Fusiliers were in billets at Muscron, where news of the armistice was received and the whole town was filled with celebrations in the streets with fifes and drums adding to the joyous atmosphere. Much is written and broadcast of that last day, with over 11,000 killed or wounded, despite many knowing the war would end in a matter of a handful of hours. But what brought the war to what seems like such a sudden stop? By the end of 1917, an Allied victory in Europe was far from certain. The Americans had come into the war, but Russia, now in a social revolution, had pulled on. Each government of the major players had now to contend with threat of strikes or in some cases a workers' revolution. Support for the war was at an all-time low. The public weary of casualty lists, food shortages and promises of victory that never materialised. Despite these problems, both the Allies and the Central Powers remained confident they could secure victory with one last bold offensive. In fact, Allied military commanders planned to use two million fresh American troops in a large offensive in 1919. In November 1917, the German High Command drew up plans for an offensive the following spring. They would penetrate the Western Front at its weakest points, firstly to bring the French to their knees and secondly to outflank British forces, push them north, forcing a surrender. When the spring offensive began in March 1918, well-trained Sturmann, meaning stormtroopers, led the German advance. Their initial advances were rapid and successful. In some areas, the Western Front was pushed back 60 kilometers, its most significant movement since 1914. German troops advanced close enough to Paris that the French capital could be shelled with a massive artillery piece. But, the stormtroopers moved more quickly than their supply lines and constantly found themselves short of food, ammunition and reinforcements. By July 1918 the assault had lost momentum. Germany had lost almost one million men in a six month period. The Germans now needed 
1.1 million new soldiers to sustain the war effort into 1919, but they also predicted that conscription would barely fill one quarter of this quota. With the arrival of the Americans in increasing numbers and fresh divisions of Australian and Canadian troops, the Allied forces broke through the German lines with considerable loss on both sides. Germany's situation was further imperiled by her domestic conditions. People were starving on the home front, due partly to the British naval blockade. Germany's position was also weakened by the loss of her allies. In the autumn of 1918, Bulgaria signed an armistice with the Allies on September 29, 1918. The Ottoman Empire signed an armistice on October the 30th. The Austro-Hungarians signed an armistice on November the 3rd, 1918. By November 1918, mutiny beset Germany. A sailor's mutiny started in Kiel and more than a dozen major cities were effectively controlled by mutinous soldiers, sailors and left-wing revolutionary groups. Kaiser Wilhelm then abdicated on November the 9th. That day, the German politician Matthias Erzberger was in Picardy, northern France, commencing armistice negotiations with French generals. The ceasefire was signed in a French railcar just before dawn, two days later. Six hours later, as per the terms of the armistice, the guns of World War I fell silent. By sheer coincidence, it was 11 a.m on the 11th day of the 11th month. Now the powers that be had to organise how and when each soldier, sailor and airman was to be returned home after four years of fighting. Wednesday 13th November 1918, poorly copied letter with much of each page off the edge probably from St. Patrick's Ward, Matter Hospital, Dublin. My dear mother, it has been so long, but I hope you and all at home are in good health. It is very trying on people at present. Today is the day the Germans, on the 21st of March. Do you think of the... Reached up last night. The war is finished after... Well, I do not think to say I am sorry, not. But I wanted to hear the news I thanked. To think I could have been out there, killed by a stray bullet, before peace was called. I think that was my luck. I received your letter all right today, and the one from Jenny. Well, we're expecting everyday news that we will be going to Belfast. All the North men are to be brought to Belfast. I do not know when or if we are all to go. I never go out, but I meet eight and nine friends in one day. And there were some slight riots in the city last night, and a few people injured. I am sorry to hear of Annie being ill, but I hope she is all right again. Miss Gardiner was not expected to be better, but she is up and able to move about again. There has not been any cases amongst the soldiers in Dublin yet that I have heard of. Well, I think this is all at present. Please forgive me for being so long in writing to you. Goodbye, your ever-loving son, Johnny. P.S. In the cutting, Sir D. Haig is speaking of the retreat of the 21st of March, and also of the 36th Ulster Division, and is for Jimmy. I shall always remember those times when we were fighting the Germans three to one. Friday 15th November 1918, St. Patrick's Ward, Matter Hospital, Dublin. My dear mother, just a few lines in answer to your ever-welcome letter, which I received all right this morning, and I am glad to know that all at home are still in good health. I hope Annie has got all right again. I am sorry that I have been so long in writing, but we have been waiting this last week for to go to Belfast. And as I was expecting to go every day, I did not write. 
they are sending all North men down to Belfast. We go on Monday, so you need hardly write again until I send you my address in Belfast. I shall write to you as soon as I get there. I am going on all right. I shall soon be well enough to leave hospital. I am sure you are glad to hear the news of Armistice being signed. It has caused some little disturbances in Dublin, but I do not think it will come to anything. I think this is all now. Goodbye. I remain your loving son, Johnny. Monday 18th November 1918, Ward 7, Royal Victoria Hospital, Belfast. My dear mother, just a line to say that I have arrived safe in Belfast. We left Dublin today at 1 o'clock and got here about 5.30. I am still going on alright and hope so are you and all at home. I hope Annie has got all right again and that Jimmy is still keeping well. I am glad to be in Belfast once more. The weather is lovely at present and I do hope it may continue as it is most pleasant. Tell Jimmy that if he is thinking of buying a new pair of boots I shall buy those that he has. I do not like paying so much money for a new pair for 7 or 8 days at home, but I do not like going around in these heavy ones. Tell him to write and tell me if he will sell them to me, and if he does he can send them to me while I am in hospital. Well, this is only a line tonight to let you know where I am, hoping to hear from you soon. I remain your loving son, Johnny. Wednesday 20th November 1918 Ward 7, Royal Victoria Hospital, Belfast. My dear mother, just a few lines in answer to your ever welcome letter today. I am glad to know that all at home are still enjoying the usual good health, as this leaves myself going on all right at present. I am still able to walk about, and we are allowed out of here from 2 pm to 7 pm every day. The weather is lovely at present. Well, Mother, I thank you very much for what you sent me. It was very good of you. I shall get along all right without the boots until I get home. I do not know how long I may be here, but I shall do my best to be home for Christmas. I hope Annie is still keeping better and that Johnny is going on all right. Well, I think that is all for now. So I will now close thanking you again for the money. Goodbye. I remain your loving son. Johnny. Thank you for listening to John Adams Letters from the Front podcast. To find out more about John Adams and his family, visit www.johnadams.org.uk forward slash letters. And you can email us with your comments or questions at letters at johnadams.org.uk. You can also follow at J Adams Letters on Twitter. The history of the 9th Service Battalion at Royal Irish Fusiliers during World War One is taken from Blackers Boys. Visit them at www.9thirishfusiliers.co.uk. That's with the number nine, not the letter. Podcasts will be published 100 years after the letters were written, so will be published nearly every month. This has been a Mark's Mass production. <laughs>